This is a video looking at the A-level chemistry topic of mass number and how it relates to isotopes and relative atomic mass. Let's start with two terms that should be familiar. Atomic number, or you might call it proton number, is the number of protons in an atom. So here there are three red protons and therefore the atomic number is three. We're now going to refer to this using the letter Z, which is for Zahl, the German word for number. The mass number is about the number of nucleons in a particular atom. So here we have three protons and four neutrons, so seven nucleons in total, and therefore the mass number is seven. We're going to refer to mass number using the letter A. Try not to get confused between mass number, which is for a particular atom like this one, and therefore has to be a whole number, and relative atomic mass, which is the sort of weighted abundance of different types of an atom, and refers to a whole sample, and therefore can be a non-integer. Let's look at another example. This iridium atom has an atomic number of 77 and a mass number of 192. Because its atomic number is 77, we know that it has 77 protons. Because it's an atom, it must have the same number of electrons as protons and therefore it has 77 electrons. In order to calculate the number of neutrons, we have to do a little calculation. The mass number is 192 and that's a combination of the number of protons and neutrons. So if we take 192 and subtract the number of protons, which we know is 77, then we're left with 115 neutrons. When it comes to ions, the same principles apply, but you have to bear in mind that the number of electrons will be different from the number of protons, because some electrons have either been gained or lost, and that's why the particle has become charged. So if we take this first example, if I look at my periodic table, I can see that sodium has an atomic number of 11, and therefore it must contain 11 protons. Now, if it were an atom, we'd expect the number of protons and electrons to be the same, and there would be 11 electrons. But that's not the case here. What's actually happened is that that sodium atom has lost an electron, and that's why it's got a positive charge, because it's lost something negative. So since it had 11 and it's lost 1, it now only has 10 electrons. We can then still do the same sum that we did before, 23, take away 11, to find out the number of neutrons, which is 12. At this point, you need to pause the video and have a go at the other four yourself. Hopefully you managed those OK. So in each instance, we've used the atomic number from the periodic table to tell us the number of protons. Then we've looked at the charge to help us work out the number of electrons. If it's positive, then we've reduced the number of electrons. And if it's negative, we've increased them. And then we've used the atomic number together with the mass number to work out the number of neutrons. I can also use these principles in reverse to identify what a particle could be. So let's start off, we've got an atom that has six protons. So straight away, I know that anything with six protons is going to be carbon. And it has the same number of neutrons as an oxygen 16 atom. So oxygen has an atomic number of eight. 16 take away eight to work out the number of neutrons is eight neutrons. So if I've got eight neutrons together with the six protons, that's going to give me an atom of carbon 14. Then if we look at this second one here, we've now got an ion, so a charged particle, and it has two fewer protons, four fewer neutrons, and one more electron than fluorine-19. So because this is fluorine, I know that this would have nine protons. And so if my new particle has two fewer, it's going to have seven. So straight away, I can look at my periodic table, I can look up what an atomic number of seven should be, and I can see that that's going to be nitrogen. Then we've got four fewer neutrons than fluorine-19. So fluorine-19 is going to have 19 minus 9 neutrons, which is 10 neutrons. And so if we've got four fewer here, then we're going to have six. So if I've got six neutrons together with my seven protons, that's going to give me a mass number of 13. Now, if this was an atom, I could stop at this point, but it's not. I've got one extra electron as well. So fluorine-19, we're just talking about an atom here. If it's got nine protons, it's going to have nine electrons as well. So if my new atom has got one more electron, it's got 10 electrons. So it's got three more electrons that has protons, and each one of those electrons has a single negative charge, so I'm going to end up with a three minus ion. We're now ready to start talking about isotopes, and you should know from GCC that isotopes are atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons, but they have the same number of protons because they're the same element, and that's what defines an element. 
If you have an atom with three protons, it's lithium. If you have an atom with six protons, it's carbon. If you have an atom with seven protons, it's nitrogen. And really nothing else matters. So we know because they're the same element that they have the same number of protons, but they're isotopes, so they have different numbers of neutrons. So the simple first part of an A-level chemistry exam question might ask you to explain what the difference is between some isotopes of a particular element. Here we've been asked to explain in terms of subatomic particles what the difference is between these three isotopes of magnesium. So remember, if we're saying in terms of subatomic particles, we want to talk about protons and electrons and neutrons. We don't want to just be saying they've got the same atomic number but different mass numbers. So what the difference is here is the number of neutrons. Magnesium 24 has 12 neutrons, magnesium 25 has 13 neutrons, and magnesium 26 has 14 neutrons. I don't actually need to mention that they all have the same number of protons because the question has asked me what the difference between them is, but given that I've got a bit of extra space, I might put down there, and they all have 12 neutrons. Now, the crucial thing about isotopes is that physically they're different, but chemically they're identical. So what I mean is that their physical properties, like their density or their radioactivity or their melting point, will be different. If you've got an atom that has more neutrons in it, that atom is obviously going to be heavier. And quite often when you start messing with the number of neutrons, you reduce the stability of the nucleus, and that's what leads to radioactive decay. But the chemical properties are determined by the electron configuration, where the electrons are. And since different isotopes have the same number of electrons and they're arranged in the same way, they're going to undergo exactly the same chemical reactions. If I take the three isotopes of hydrogen, so regular hydrogen and then deuterium and tritium, which are hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3, they all form water with the formula H2O. So here's the second part of that exam question that we already saw, and it asks how, if at all, the chemical properties of the isotopes will differ. So the answer is they don't differ, and the reason they don't differ is because they have the same electron configuration or the same electron arrangement or the same number of electrons in their outer shell. Now, we mentioned already that there's a difference between mass number and relative atomic mass. So the mass number refers to a particular atom. Here we've got lithium with a mass number of seven and lithium with a mass number of nine, whereas the relative atomic mass refers to a sample and says, well, what's the kind of average mass of all of the atoms in there? So we need to be able to work that out using abundance data. So let's say that we've got a sample here that is made up of 90% lithium seven and 10% lithium nine and I want to know what the overall relative atomic mass will be. All I actually have to do is work out what 90% of 7 is and what 10% of 9 is, and then add them together. Now, it's really up to you how you do this. You could um, multiply by the abundance and then divide by 100. You could use a percentage button on your calculator. Personally, I'm a fan of decimals. So I've done 0.9 to represent that 90% multiplied by 7, and then 0.1 to represent the 10% multiplied by 9, and I get the answers 6.3 and 0.9, and I add them up and I get 7.2. Now, I'm always a fan of doing a common sense check. I'm expecting an answer that's somewhere between 7 and 9, and that's much closer to 7 because that's the most abundant isotope, and that is what I've got. So I've got a relative atomic mass of 7.2. So just to emphasize that one more time, the mass number is about how many protons and neutrons there are in one atom, whereas the relative atomic mass is the weighted abundance of an entire sample. Take this opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you're confident in doing these kinds of calculations. Here is some answers so you can check your work. Hopefully they all came out OK. Now, when it comes to the exams, they're not just going to give you two isotopes. They're probably going to give you four or five, but the exact same principles apply. So let's have a look at a proper question. Now, here you'll notice that it doesn't say mass number. It says M slash Z. That will make a lot more sense once we've talked about mass spectrometry. But for now, you can just assume it basically means the same thing as the mass number in this instance. So for each one of these four isotopes, we have an abundance. How much of the sample is made up of that particular mass number isotope? So we've got 9.1% of the isotope that has a mass of 46 and so on and so on. So all we need to do is work out what is 9.1% of 46 and 7.8% of 47 and so on and so forth. So we've done this here. As I said before, you can um, multiply by the percentage and then divide by 100. You can use the percentage button on your calculator. I'm a big fan of decimals because it just seems to go wrong less often. So for each one, I've multiplied the decimal that represents the percentage by the mass of that particular isotope. 
and then I've added together all of those numbers and I get 47.825. Now you'll notice that I haven't rounded those numbers until the end, even though it tells me that I'm going to give my answer to one decimal place. And that's basically because the way I can be the most accurate is to use my full calculator display for everything and then only round at the end. So then I'm going to give my answer to one decimal place because that's what the question has asked for. We can also use these same principles in reverse to work out the abundance of different isotopes given the relative atomic mass of a sample. So in this question, we've again got magnesium 24, 25 and 26, and we know that magnesium 25 is making up 10% of that sample. And we know that the overall relative atomic mass is 24.3. So now we need to work out how much magnesium 24 and magnesium 26 there are. So we know that in total, we're going to have 100%. So we've got the 10% of the magnesium 25 and then a number representing magnesium 24 and whatever is left over, that must be the magnesium 26. So the first thing we can do is eliminate the magnesium 25. So I work out what 10% of 25 is by doing 0.1 times 25 to be 2.5 and then I take that away. So now I'm only worrying about the two isotopes that are left. So that 21.8 that we're left with is made up of the abundance of magnesium 24 multiplied by 24 and the abundance of magnesium 26 multiplied by 26. And I know, because I've already taken away the 10% of magnesium 25, that those two remaining ones must add up to 90%. So there's no point in me using two different letters. I may as well use X for the abundance of magnesium 24 and then 0.9 take away X to be the abundance of magnesium 26. So if I look, do a little bit of bracket expanding, I can now say that my 21.8 is made up of 24x and then 23.4, so 0.9 times 26, take away 26x. So if I take away 23.4 from both sides of the equation, I end up with minus 1.6 is 24x take 26x. And if I go one step further, minus 1.6 is minus 2x. So if I divide everything by minus 2, I find out that 0.8 is x. And remember, at the beginning we said that x was going to be the abundance of my uh, magnesium 24, and then 0.9 take away x would be my abundance of magnesium 26. So I now need to convert those decimals back into percentages, and I can say that magnesium 24 makes up 80% of that sample, and magnesium 26 makes up 10%. So that's everything that you need to understand about isotopes before we can start talking about mass spectrometry. Hopefully it was helpful. Don't forget to subscribe.